Just last week, Iran launched over 300 weapons at Israel, roughly 170 drones, and over 30 crews and 120 ballistic missiles. Despite that, the attack has been described as mostly a failure. The reason for that is most of Iran's weapons either failed or were shot down. The figure often repeated is 99% were intercepted, but that does conflict with videos and the US stating 9 missiles did hit targets. So that would mean either there were 900 plus launched, not 300, or the intercept rate was about 97% at best, and even lower if you don't count the ones that failed. Either way, it's kind of a minor point since no military targets were destroyed, only reportedly minor damage at two air bases, and only one real injury throughout the whole strike. But I decided to take a look for myself and see if there was any satellite imagery I could buy. And shockingly, there actually was. So I bought it to show you. And that ended up being a bad idea. It got me, quote, flagged. And after several back and forths, I explained my reason, and I guess I convinced them enough that I wasn't a spy. But I'm not allowed to show you the images. The owners of the satellites state that no imagery over Israel can be used for media or external publishing. But since I spent a good amount of money on these, I could still tell you about what the satellite imagery shows, and compare that to what others have highlighted as potential damage using lower resolution imagery on Twitter. And speaking of money, I recently found out that a company I had used was still charging me for a subscription every month. And this went on for several months before I noticed. Well, today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. And perfect for just this type of stuff. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. I'm using Rocket Money to cancel unwanted subscriptions. I mean, let's face it, it seems every company wants you to subscribe to their services these days, and they make it so easy to do so, which ends up making it easy to forget about. They safely and securely identify recurring charges and cancel unwanted subscriptions for you. I'm also using Rocket Money to help set a budget. I just recently got married, and now I have to be an adult and be smarter with my money. Rocket Money has helped save its customers up to $740 a year, with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. To save more and spend less, join the over 5 million members using Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash covertcabal, or click the link in the description to get started for free. You can also unlock even more features with Premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash covertcabal to get started for free. I bought imagery of two bases, and each on two different dates. One after the strike, and one before for comparison. And again, unfortunately, I can't show you these, but I can show you the free Sentinel-2 imagery for reference. Sentinel-2 is what a lot of these Twitter posts use. It, though, is roughly 10 meter resolution. The ones I got are half meter, so that's 20 times more pixels both vertically and horizontally. So it's got 400 times more pixels. Way better. Now one note, when you buy satellite imagery, you pay for how much area or square kilometers you select. So as you can see the outline of where I purchased, I only selected the runways, hangars, and other structures, and not the open, empty desert areas in between. You can see here it was about 9 square kilometers. If I would have purchased every empty area in between, that would have been closer to 50 square kilometers, which means it would have costed me over 5 times more. So there is a chance that other rockets struck areas nearby that I didn't include, but that would mean that they didn't hit anything but empty desert, and maybe a few abandoned structures. But at Nevadam, and I'm probably pronouncing that way wrong, only one spot is obvious, right here. In the higher resolution, you can see that the damage is actually larger than you could see in this image, with likely debris flying south and hitting one or more of these aircraft, which are C-130s. And Israel did say that one C-130 was damaged, so this was likely where that happened. But if we assume they aimed for the apron here, that means it missed by 250 to 300 meters. The only other spot in the entire base, and I looked for hours and hours, is a small black spot here that appeared. This one is real weird, as it's just an old concrete pad that only connects to the rest of the base through an old windy road. The other dark spots you can see are shadows from clouds. Some of them are more obvious than others, but we can draw a line from the center of the cloud to the shadow, and then move it around at other spots with dark areas and see if they correspond to a cloud. Like here is a cloud you might not otherwise notice. At the other base, Ramon, there is no obvious signs of impact or damage anywhere except just outside a hangar here. In Sentinel-2 imagery, comparing it to an image 10 days earlier, you can just very slightly see it, and the dust probably was kicked up, partially covering the road just above it. As for these other four sites that people mentioned, this one here is part of a recreational area for the housing section, complete with basketball and tennis courts, football or soccer if you're American, and two pools and trees. This area circled is just trees around the smaller pool, where, depending on the sunlight and shadows from the trees, it can look significantly different on different days. But there is no damage here whatsoever. The two to the right are just shadows from trees, and then the final one way south. I didn't buy imagery of that area, as there's no buildings or structures besides a perimeter fence. The closest possible target is nearly a kilometer away, and it's an ammo storage area. 
This ammo site has hardened ammo bunkers, so even if they did have a direct hit, it wouldn't have done too much damage. So that's only three confirmed hits I could find, and possibly a fourth outside the area I purchased, but would have only hit a fence at best. But the US says nine, five at Nevada and four at Ramon. Note here, they do say Negev, but that's just referring to Ramon. At Nevada, they say a damaged C-130, which would be this one again, an unused runway, which I can confirm that no runways show any sign whatsoever of being hit. Maybe they're referring to this same site and considering this taxiway to be runway grade. Then they also say empty storage facilities, which could be this here again. At Ramon, they don't say where, but overall, it's possible the two total missile impacts I've identified actually didn't damage, and the others just hit open areas that I didn't get imagery of. But it means again that it didn't do any damage. So if Iran's entire attack with 300 plus weapons only did very minor damage, then how could it possibly be seen as a success? A few reasons. One is that it made Israel and the US and allies use up valuable and limited interceptor missiles to shoot them down, especially Israel. They only have so many interceptors, like Arrow 3. They likely don't have a very large stockpile and might be dangerously low for any future attack Iran carries out. Also, Iran used many older and less advanced missiles in the attack, and that is clear. For example, reportedly older Ahmad and Gadiero 110 ballistic missiles instead of newer and more accurate Komar Ashar and Fatah 1. And this might explain for the lower accuracy that we see in satellite imagery where they apparently missed by several hundred meters. So again, this allowed Iran to use up older and less capable missiles while still forcing Israel to use their most capable and expensive interceptors. Also, by Israel using their missile defenses, they would reveal their locations and radar sites. This is often referred to as the electronic order of battle. Mapping it out would enable Iran to plan any future attack more effectively. Then finally, it's a domestic and regional propaganda win. They showed off a powerful image of themselves attacking Israel directly for the first time ever, and that they are willing to strike if need be. But at the same time, and part of this might just been blind luck, but the fact that there was such minimal damage also minimizes Israel's justification for a larger retaliation attack, and it gives an off-ramp to de-escalate. Speaking of Israel's counterattack, which at the time I'm writing this, is just going on. So far it seems to be small though, but it would also force Iran to turn on their radars and reveal their air defenses and electronic order of battle. But the more interesting possibility to explore might be Israel attacking Iran's nuclear sites. Given the minor damage that Iran caused, this is unlikely, but it's worth taking a look at. Iran has several nuclear facilities that would rank high on Israel's wish list to destroy, but the two that might rank the highest are Ferdo and Natanz. These are used for uranium enrichment, which is the most important step moving toward building a nuclear bomb. Uranium isn't really that hard to get, but the problem is natural uranium is mostly U-238, which is no good. Less than 1% is U-235, which is needed for a bomb. So these enrichment facilities are used to separate and remove that U-238, and you really have to remove a lot of it. Normally, for nuclear weapons, you want roughly 90% enriched, which means removing roughly 99.9% .9 of all the U-238. So these enrichment sites consist of huge arrays of centrifuges. These each slowly remove a little bit of that bad U-238 before moving on to the next one to remove a tiny bit more, and so on. So, as for how long it might take Iran to have enough to build a bomb, there are some figures out there that I think a lot of people don't understand to help estimate. If they were to start from scratch right now, using natural uranium, typically you need about 50 kilograms of enriched uranium for a bomb, at 90%. The tails here is just what's sent back to another centrifuge. The feed would be about 0.7% because it's natural uranium. This gives a figure of a little over 10,000 SWUs, or separative work units. A lot of centrifuges only are capable of one, more advanced ones, maybe 20 or 30 SWUs per year. So you can tell you need a lot of centrifuges. If they want to be less efficient with a tails of 0.3, then it's just under 10,000. Iran's total centrifuge capacity is reported to be about 18,300 SWUs per year. So it would take just over six months for enough to build one bomb. That's starting from scratch though. According to an IAEA report, Iran has produced over 1.6 tons of 5% enriched uranium. So using that would almost be enough to produce two bombs in 110 days, or less than two months each. None of this is to say that Iran is actually going to build a nuclear bomb though, and there's a lot more that's required beyond just having the enriched uranium, but it is the biggest hurdle. The actual design of fission bombs is pretty well known, and you can even find it on Wikipedia. But either way, you can see why these two sites which do this are important for Israel to destroy, as they believe, or at least are extremely worried, that Iran is going to build nuclear weapons. Because of that, both these sites are buried deep underground to protect them. You can see here in Natanz and Google Earth, they're constructing larger facilities and then burying them underground. 
These here are almost certainly full of those centrifuges I mentioned, and likely the location of the images of former Iranian president walking through a cascade of centrifuges were taken. So, assuming Israel was trying to destroy Natan specifically, first, Israel has struck other nuclear sites in both Iraq and Syria, however those were both much closer. The Syrian reactor was roughly 600 kilometers away, and the Iraqi one about 900. Natanz is over 1,600 kilometers away. On top of that is Iran's much more capable air defense systems, radars, and interceptor aircraft that Iraq and Syria didn't have. And this is actually where Israel's small counterattack could have helped. As I mentioned, it would have helped Israel map out Iran's defenses, and then could be used to plan out routes to avoid detection and air defenses as much as possible, and strike others that can't be avoided. But again, at 1,600 kilometers away, that's a long distance for strike aircraft Israel has. They would need to refuel along the way, and along the way is over countries like Jordan, Iraq, or even Saudi Arabia or Turkey, which makes any attack much more complicated politically and difficult to avoid Iran discovering it. But if we assume they could do all that, despite these facilities being buried underground, Israel does have the bombs that could likely penetrate the ground enough to destroy them. The GBU-27, equipped with the BLU-109 penetrating warhead for example, which Israel bought 500 of back in 2006. These two larger original facilities, as you can see, are not buried too deeply underground. That was 20 years ago though. Starting in 2009 and continuing to this day, Iran started digging tunnels into the side of a mountain just south of the main site. And these are much, much deeper and protected, certainly outside the capability of Israel to penetrate and destroy them, short of using a nuclear weapon themselves. In fact, it's doubtful even the largest bunker-busting bomb the US has would be able to get the job done. The best Israel might hope for is to destroy the tunnel entrances. However, once the debris is cleared, the facility would be back and running again. And the same is true for the other enrichment facility at Ferdo. But what about ballistic missiles to attack the sites, like Iran did? They would avoid all the complications of flying manned aircraft over countries and likely unable to be shot down by Iran. Well, Israel never really focused on long-range conventional missiles like Iran has. Instead, Israel invested in their air forces and aircraft, which arguably served them much better during wars with their neighbors. Israel does have some long-range ballistic missiles, the Jericho series. However, these are for delivering nuclear warheads. They could, in theory, put conventional warheads on them, but Israel isn't believed to have very many of them, likely around only 40 or 50, and they'd obviously want to save some for their nuclear deterrent. Plus, they weren't designed to be precision strike weapons. They do have some long-range, air-launched, supersonic, and even semi-ballistic missiles that they could use, but again, they have nowhere near a powerful enough warhead to destroy any of these sites. So, what happens next? We'll have to see. Both sides' strikes seem to be relatively small, likely providing a way to de-escalate. However, neither Iran or Israel are known to back down easily, 